already figured it out, but it's a little bit too hot to wear a scarf. So yeah, I have to say I'm delighted to be here to lose as an American at a European science land. That's pretty great. So yeah. <laughs> I'm a normal human person. I spend time on the internet, I check stuff out, and sometimes I read some pretty crazy stuff on the internet. So for example, I came across this once, and this is the idea that women use 20,000 words a day, and men only use 7,000. Now this number comes from Luann Brizendine in her book called The Female Brain. So another thing I read on the internet is that women use twice as many words a day as men, and that's because we have to repeat everything we say to them. <laughs> is that true, my sisters? That's true, right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> science. So this is Matthias Mail, and he and his colleagues in Arizona developed a recorder, and they asked 400 men and women to wear this recorder so that they could actually test whether or not women do talk more than men over the course of a day. Now I'm going to show you their data. Are you ready for this? I'm going to make it nice and easy. The women will be in pink and the men will be in blue. Ladies, are you ready? This is what they found. I'm kidding. This is what they found. I'm kidding. This is what they found. <laughs> I'm just messing with the scales. It would be so much funnier. <laughs> okay, yeah. So what they actually found was, the graphs were showing you the same thing. I was just playing with the scales and it was supposed to work. Um, but what they found was women use 16,215 words a day on average in their study, and the men used 15,669 words a day. Now you might look at this and think, wow, this is a difference. But um, the nerd in me had to do the math. And if you do the math, it's a difference of about 550 words. Now men and women over the course of a day used about 16,000 words, and 550 is 3% of 16,000. So the difference wasn't actually that impressive. And the researchers actually looked at you know, the statistical difference and they found no difference between men and women. They both talked the same amount per day. So science destroyed that myth. And if you're wondering whether or not 16,000 words a day is a lot, well, we can do the math here. The average speaking rate in English is 150 words per minute for somebody who's not doing a science slam. And again, if you do the math, that ends up being a little bit under two hours. So you expect to read some pretty crazy shit on the internet, you can kind of take this for granted, but you do not expect to see crazy shit in academic journals. And that happened to me uh, once in 2015. Oh, I'm sorry, am I not supposed to swear? <laughs> it's all right. Damn it. <laughs> so anyway, I came across this article, called, it's called The Fossilization of Non-Current English Pronunciation in German uh, Ethel Teaching. So this is an article about why Germans have an accent when they speak English. <laughs> this is my universe, so of course I read this article. Yeah, so I read the article. And um, I had uh, two options here in terms of responding. I could chill or, you know, not. And if you know me, I, um, I have no chill. So I went for that option. And I wrote an article. Can you press it twice? Sorry. Thanks. So I wrote an article called Germans are not aiming for a fossilized form of English, a response to Booth 2015. And I'll tell you guys, I'm not sorry, I did. So this is what Booth was saying. He was saying that English speakers, when they speak and they say words like Batman, they have an a ah vowel. That's okay. But when German speakers speak, and you can tell this guy's German because he has beer. Gibt es Deutsche heute Abend? Yay! So he's, he's drinking beer, he's German, it's obvious, right? So Germans have a tendency to say Batman instead of Batman, right? This is not controversial, but Booth has a really weird way of explaining this. Oh, and I'll give you an example for, for French speakers. So this is, a, this is a French speaker, and you can tell she's French because she's got the lipstick. And in French, you have an U vowel. So in French, I think you have the word je. Right? I hope I'm saying that right. Right? But in American English, we don't have that vowel. So that means Americans would say that word something like Jew. Right? <laughs> it doesn't sound the same. So it's that idea that when we say vowels in a different language, they can be a little bit complicated. So we're going to go back to the a eh, eh problem, right? So this is what Booth is talking about. He's saying that Germans have, a tr have trouble with this vowel. That's OK. His explanation for it, though, is batshit crazy. So what he says in his article is that Germans are actually aiming for an old accent of English in which these two vowels sounded the same. This is an accent that was spoken in the 1940s. 
So he was saying also on the same page of the article that most Germans have probably never heard this accent, right? And this left me to think, okay, that's fantastic. Can you imagine imitating an accent that you never heard? It's crazy. So let's look at some science. So these are the English, uh, the vowel charts for German and English. And I've given you the symbols here that represent the different vowel sounds in these languages. And they are <laughs> plotted according to where they're produced in the mouth. So the A vowel is here. It's a low front vowel because the tongue is low and it forwards in the mouth when we produce it, A. Ah. But if you look <laughs> at the German vowel chart, there is no vowel here. The Germans have no vowel like that. And that's why Germans have trouble producing that vowel. Instead they use the next closest vowel they have, which is the E, eh, and that is why they say Bettmann, not because they're imitating an accent that they've never, ever heard. <laughs> so if we look at the French vowel, this is where the French vowel U is when you say je, right? But if we look at the English vowel chart, thanks. <laughs> if we look at the English chart, we have no vowel there. We have no vowel that's close to that. So instead, we say ooh, we take the next closest vowel. Thanks. All right, so let's go back to the problem that Germans have, this a eh, eh problem. There's a lot of research in this area, old research, this was published in 1992, and Bowdoin what they had people do is they had native speakers of English say bat and bet, and then they plotted how these vowels are produced for native speakers, and you'll see we have two different vowel spaces for these vowels. They're meaning distinguishing vowels for us in English. And here we have the beginner Germans, and I don't mean people who are just beginning to be German, I mean <laughs> Germans who are just beginning to learn English. And when they produce these two vowels, they produce the same vowel, bat and bet. They say bet and bet for both. However, Germans, when they have a little bit more experience with English, begin to have two separate vowels, just like native speakers do, okay? All right, oh, shall I go on bit moji me? Well, I will. There's okay. another problem that German speakers have, and that's the wa va problem, right? Oh, it's, oh, it's awful, isn't it? <laughs> so here we have the native speakers, and in black we have the v sound. This is a labial dental fricative, where the teeth and the lips come together and you have vibration. Mm. And this place where you have the white space there, that's the w sound. This is where the two lips come close together, but they don't touch. Now, if we look at the beginner Germans, again, they're not beginning to be German, they're just beginning to learn English, right? You see all this gray here. They don't have two different sounds for these, these two consonants. They produce basically the same sound. But Germans who begin to have a little bit more experience with this begin to become more native-like, having a clear distinction between v and w. And this is where my research comes in. So I noticed this, teaching my students, that they had trouble with this. They would tell me things like, I come from a weary small village. And I thought, okay, they have trouble pronouncing this, but do they have trouble recognizing the sound? So I did an experiment with a student of mine. This is Raphael Morshed, he's a, he's a student of mine. <laughs> totally true story. And uh, what we did is we showed them two syllables on the screen, wa and va, and then we played them a sound. And then they're supposed to press a button on the right or the left to indicate which sound they heard, right? And these are the results. So my Germans had an error rate <laughs> Can I have a little bit more time? Because I just didn't have a clicker that worked. Okay, thanks. Um, so the Germans had an error rate that is a little bit better than chance. They had a really, really hard time hearing the distinction between v and wa. And because I teach at the university, I was trying to figure out, okay, how can I help them? How can I teach them? So then I went back to the science. What we have here is the International Phonetic Alphabet. This is a list of symbols that we use to describe sounds of the world's languages. We have consonants and vowels and then other details that we can have in pronunciation. And here we have the V sound for English. Like I said, it's a labial dental fricative. The teeth and the lips come together and there's a vibration. And down here, we have the wa sound. And this is where the two lips come together, wa, but they don't touch. We call that a labial velar approximant. And this is a sound that Germans have a tendency to make, and this sound is exactly between these two sounds. It's the teeth and the lips come close to each other, but they don't touch. And that's why Germans have trouble producing the sound, because they don't have anything like that in their native language. Now, I can explain it using science, but I can also explain this using dogs. And if I can, that means I will. So <laughs> let's look at these dogs. I would like you to notice the, uh, the lip rounding that they're engaging in here, right? If these dogs were to speak, they would say wary. Now, you don't want that in English. Instead, you want to be like this dog. And I want you to notice <laughs> the teeth lip placement here. If this dog was going to speak, he would say very. And that's the kind of sound you would like to make if you're speaking English. So that's me done. And that is me explaining language using science and not myths.
Thank you very much, Toulouse. <laughs>